Um, so I want to welcome you all to the, um, the first workshop that we have for practical parenting series, <laughs> Understanding Your Toddler. So thank you for coming. It's like a beautiful day outside, so I always use that as a guide for how motivated people are to come to uh, inside for a lecture. So it's a little harder to, um, uh, to come in, but I'm glad that you guys made it. Um, because um, uh, we have a presentation to present. We are going to have a video of the presentation available later tonight on the website um, at the childmind.org um, event page. And the next, there's three more lectures in this seri series. The next lecture is really on um, practical parenting tips for managing some of those moments when your child tells you, no, I'm not going to do it, and you have to try to think about how to negotiate with them about <coughs> getting them on board and cooperating. Um, and that's going to be presented by Steve Kurtz, who is um, really an expert on behavioral management techniques for, for children. We'll have another lecture on language development. That's the last in the series, and a lecture on um, kind of separation, um, which when I dropped my toddler daughter off today at her grandmother's house, that was one of the experiences that I had to kind of manage as well, the, the, the tough times of separating at, at, at this point in, in her life. Um, so um, today we're going to talk um, more to you about kind of a general overview of uh, uh, toddler development um, and, um, and trying to think about how to understand your toddler. Um, Ken and Natalie and I all have toddlers, so we all thought it was great to work together to present the, uh, these ideas, and we share, um, uh, you know, we'll share our own experiences with you, and um, we'll have time after our lecture to answer questions or talk about some of the ideas that we presented as well. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so I want to start by just kind of giving you an overview of the presentation that we have planned for you. We're going to talk um, about developmental milestones. It's really some of those markers that you are looking for and thinking about as your child gets older, the things that you want to see happening for them in language development, in motor development, and how they function in the world. Um, with the mindset that there is a real tension between uh, uh, what comes kind of naturally on board and what happens in children's development that we can stimulate and, and, and enhance because of the ways that we interact with them and interface with them. So that's that kind of nature nurture debate. Debate. We really know that nothing is definitely one uh, side of the coin. It's not all nature and all nurture. But we do have some understanding that some of the skills that come on board really can be more influenced by environmental exposure, and some are a little bit more hardwired. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to think about those ideas because they still play out in some of the, the uh, ways, things that we see. We'll talk about really um, briefly cognitive development because it really sets the stage. The way a child's brain develops sets the stage for their ability to do all these activities that they do, like play. <clears throat> Um, where they're really using their mind to think about ideas and, 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 and engage the world, and then think about their behavior and the way that they manage their emotional experiences, and we'll talk also about socialization. Um, we'll discuss with you when you should have concerns about your child and what kind of uh, red flags there are to, to notice, and then we'll talk about early interventions um, so that thinking, if you do have concerns and you find out that there's something that, that is really delayed in your child development, what to do about that to really um, help identify the problem and think about solutions to the problem. Um, some aspects of development occur on their own, so this is kind of that uh, nature side of the coin. I'll talk briefly when we talk about socialization about some of those aspects, but one of the aspects that's really interesting to think about is that very, very early in a child's development, they can start to recognize faces. So even at 24 uh, hours old, they recognize the smell of their mother. You may have heard that um, children hear their mother's voice when they're in the womb, so they, they already have a, a, an affinity for their mother's voice when they arrive uh, in this world. Um, but they also recognize other people's faces and are attracted to other people's faces more than anything else. So there's no real exposure that they've had to what a person's face looks like until they arrive, but they have a natural preference for people's faces. So if you show them an image that has 
two dots on the top and one at the bottom, kind of like eyes and a mouth. They orient towards that and they like to look at that for a longer period of time. So that's early on in a child's development. Really um, strikingly tells us that something natural has happened, that their minds are already pre-programmed for having an affinity towards your faces. Like that's amazing and remarkable to me. They, the, the, this affinity is so strong that they can't easily recognize a face if it's turned upside down. That they don't process that face quite as quickly or as accurately as they do if they see an object that's turned upside down. They need more time to look at a face if it's turned upside down because this hard wiring helps them automatically have a special specialty in facial recognition. So it's kind of a remarkable sign of the way that uh, nature has influenced our development. Many developmental milestones, though, are achieved through the support of parents and the environment. Um, in particular, I think it's helpful to think about um, uh, language development because children really do benefit from all the conversation that parents have with them. There's pretty clear research that even before a child has learned to uh, speak or sowed any words, that their exposure to the amount of words that they hear really influences the amount of vocabulary they'll have later on. So talking to them all the time about everything that you're doing, about everything they can do, even before they utter a peep, is a very valuable exposure and really does influence their development along those lines. So we want to kind of think with you about what things parents can do to support their child's development. Even though some of these things are hardwired, many of these things are going to be exposed to um, benefit from your exposure and your enrichment. I'm going to turn the mic over to Ken because he's going to talk in more detail about the developmental milestones. Thank you, Matt. Again, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm going to, to speak in brief about the, the developmental milestones uh, going through toddlerhood because that could in itself be two or three different lectures uh, because of the amount of, of learning and experiences that our toddlers go through during this age range. Um, but I do want to, to identify some of the categories of where the developmental milestones fall into. Uh, we're looking for our child's development across several domains, including their movement, and that's their gross motor movement, um, arms and legs, their trunk, really how they move their whole bodies. And we start looking for those <laughs> things very, very early on when baby turns his or her head, begins to roll over, you start looking at those things. But those developmental milestones, they do proceed into, into toddler development going into the third and the fourth years where children are expected to start running or jumping with two feet or kicking a ball. There are specific age ranges, and I say ranges, uh, not specific times when children are expected to do certain things. Uh, we're also looking at hand and finger skills. Some people will call this fine motor um, development. Uh, language skills, as Matt was speaking about. Cognitive functioning, that is a uh, child's thinking abilities. Uh, social and emotional development, and also adaptive skills, how, they, how a child is learning to take care of themselves. Um, Many of the developmental milestones you can find in any number of apps on your telephones. You can find, it on hun find them on hundreds of different websites, including, including the Child Mind Institute website. You'll see lists of what the developmental milestones and ranges of where, uh, where children are expected to meet certain things. Another one of my favorites is the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is often updating their information on child development, so that's another great resource that's available to everyone for free. Um, now when we speak about developmental milestones, I, I do want to stress that each one of them does have a very specific age range, not a specific 
age when things are expected to occur. To occur. And just to, to give you um, a sense of how big these age ranges can be, obviously I've just chosen one particular milestone from, from each of the areas. These age ranges can range up to an entire year where we're expecting a child to be able to do a certain thing. So if, if a child is saying a certain word or doing a certain thing at a certain age, his or her peer may not be doing that at the exact same time. It may happen earlier, it may happen later, and that's okay, which is why we, we, we try to think of these things in age ranges for expectations. It's not like getting a driver's license, you go on your 17th birthday and boom, there it is. Um, I do want to, to go into some of the expectations and some of the things that we can do to facilitate these things in our children through play. Um, everything is a learning opportunity for an infant or a toddler. Um, everything from opening their eyes in the morning to how we put them to sleep at night. These are, these are interactions and these are experiences within which our, our children can learn. And it's important for, for parents to, to make sure that these activities, in particular play, is abundant, is very variable, and that um, I put abundant up there twice. Just realized that um, it's it's abundant. That's it's very abundant it it's be. it's very <laughs> abundant. It's uh, we wanted to say it twice. Um, it's abundant. It's very variable, and it's very frequent. So you want to. When you're playing with your children or when you're providing opportunities for them to play, have a great number of activities at your disposal or at their disposal. Books, games, puzzles, blocks, toys, anything including the kitchen spoon and a pot or a pot holder, any of these things can be used as a play activity for, for a child within this age range. They're learning about everything, not only the, <laughs> the, the toys that, that you can buy in Toys R Us. Um, and it's also very important to keep in mind that play is not only a physical activity. Um, as parents, we can nurture our children's play activities through the way that we speak with them. Um, even before children have learned to use words themselves, they're absorbing the words that we're telling them. They're absorbing the sentences, they're absorbing our grammar, they're absorbing the way that we say things and in the context that we put them in. <laughs> so being your child's narrator, and that almost sounds like the opposite because anyone that has a two or three year old, they become your narrator. Mommy or daddy, you're doing this. Mommy or daddy, you're doing that. But that comes, comes out of you being the narrator for your child. When your child picks up a block, you say, oh, you picked up that block. Let's turn the page of the book. Any action that you can do, you can describe that action in words and foster that development in your child. Um, so the amount of talking that you do is, is very crucial. It is a crucial factor. As Matt was saying, that even before they begin to speak on their own, they're acquiring that language from the interactions with their parents and also their older siblings. And we want to make sure as parents that the, that the quality of our interactions is as high as we can possibly provide. Um, so keeping the, the interactions that we have variable, varying the, the activities that we do, varying the things that we say and using to describe, you want to say and do lots and lots of things. And you want these to be close parent-child together interactions as much as you can possibly do. And um, just, to, just to really to summarize, how, these, how our children really gain these experiences through play is through what their parents provide for them. So as parents, we can provide plenty of opportunities for our children to play. And um, we can all understand and 
really, really reinforce that absolutely anything can be turned into a play activity for, for a toddler. And um, I can't stress enough that the more you talk to your child, the more experience they will have. Even doing the same activity more than once with different words, it just became a new activity. So the more talking that you can do, the better. And now I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Natalie to speak about uh, behavior and emotions. I'll just hold this like this. So I chose to talk about this topic because First, I'm a mother of a three-year-old, and I found it really hard to understand how my daughter's mind was developing and what was normal versus abnormal in terms of her behavior. The other thing was that I was doing a research study when I was looking at some data, and they were um, talking to a thousand parents. And they were all normal developing kids. And there was a question that said, how does your child behave? And it was like, better than average, average, worse than average, terrible. 93% of parents said worse than average. And these were completely normal kids, right? So that made me think, we all think that what our children are doing is not OK. Whereas, in fact, most children are doing exactly the same thing, right? And for me, that was very reassuring to feel like, oh, OK. <laughs> that means my child is OK. I don't have to worry so much, right? But also it made me think about what are children's minds like and how much do they understand about the world when they're born and as they develop. And so the way I think about it is, Children come to this world, and it's completely foreign. They don't know the language. They don't know the rules. They don't know their norms. They don't know what's bad, what's good, what's acceptable. They have no idea. They have very little ways to express themselves, right? So when they're really young, they cry. But they don't really even know why they're crying most of the time. They feel something. They feel discomfort. But they can really say, oh, it's because I'm hungry. It's because my diaper is wet. They just feel something. So it's really our role to explain them and to give them words and give them rules and norms to understand the world better and to do better in general, right? As they grow older, when they're, you know, one, two, they, they have more awareness of what's going on, but they still don't have the words. You know, they say mama, papa, dada, but they can't really express much more than that. So what do they do? They use actions, right? So for example, the other day I was in a store and I saw this dad who was completely in love with his little daughter who was probably like 14 months. And my daughter was standing in the way. So the little girl walked to her and kind of pushed her, right? Because she wanted to go through and she couldn't say, excuse me, I need to go through, right? And the dad felt appalled. He was like, he started giving her this whole lecture, I can't believe you did this, this is so wrong, we don't do that. But he really felt like, what's wrong with my child? Whereas in fact, what her child did was really healthy. I mean, she was trying to express her needs, right? In the only way she could. So I think it's really important to be aware of these things, because otherwise we can over-pathologize things. And we can become very negative without wanting to, right? We can say, no, 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 there's so much to say no to when a child is young, right? So it's really important to understand where they're coming from, to change the way we interact with them, and also to not be so stressed out. Because I think most of us would agree that having a toddler is exhausting. We love them, they're a lot of fun, but they always want to do something, they never give you a break, you can never read the newspaper, answer a phone call, nothing, right? So it's really easy for us to sometimes feel stressed and, and kind of lose our temper. So at this age, hitting is a way to communicate. So what do you do? You might just gently take her hand and say, we don't do that and move on. Or just, you know, move her because the other child is going to get upset and move on. Once she's older, once she has the words, she'll be able to do something different. But at this age, it's really hard. Another big thing is biting, right? So most two-year-olds bite at some point in their lives. And the way some people think about it is that they don't really have empathy yet. They don't really understand that other people have their own minds. It's all very self-centered. They're still trying to understand who's this other person next to me and so on, right? And they learn that when they bite, they can cause someone to have a reaction. And it's really exciting, right? Like, wow, that person is crying. They don't totally understand, oh, she's in pain. She doesn't like this, but it's wow, right? And it's also, it has an effect, right? If someone takes their toy and they bite, they have the toy back, most likely. They'll have a chance to grab the toy. So it has an effect. So again, that doesn't mean that you have to encourage biting. You have to, again, move her, like try to help her model for her. This is what we do. We say, no, yes, you can share. Or we say, I'm sorry. But don't overdo it. Don't feel overly stressed about it, because it's just really normal behavior. Another really important thing is uh, sharing, right? 
So children don't understand that things belong to you or to me and that we have to share in the world. And it's also confusing because adults don't share. Like I don't share my car with the person walking next to me, right? Or we, we, we have our property and we don't share so much. So for them it's confusing, like, okay, so I'm supposed to be sharing all the time. You're not really sharing. And I don't understand the sense of property. So at some point they do get, okay, this is mine. And they're learning, like, this is mine, this is mine. And they, it, it reinforces the concept of property, of belonging. So they do it a lot, right? As they grow older, most likely they'll be able to share. So again, you model. You tell them, no, we do have to share sometimes. Or you tell them, we'll take turns. But don't feel overly stressed if they're doing that. Because again, it's completely normal. And we expect them to see that. If a child didn't care at all, I would start worrying that they don't have any interest whatsoever in their things. or It would be really unusual most of the time. Another big thing is separation anxiety. So there's a point in time where kids have to experience separation anxiety because again, they're building bonds, they're building attachments. They learn like my mom or my dad are the most important people in my life and I, I prefer to be with them than others. They, they learn that there's a concept of strangers, of not really knowing this person and having to kind of protect myself from the other persons. And it's very healthy, right? You don't want the child to just walk out with whoever and not really care. But a lot of parents start worrying, is my child overly anxious? Is he going to have a problem afterwards? Do I have to encourage him to, to stay by himself? This is a phase. It usually lasts a few months and so on. And then it completely goes away. They always prefer you, but as they grow older and as they have a better sense of attachment and bonding, and as, as they understand that you're not going to disappear, that you'll come back, the more they have this experience of you leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back they'll be able to understand that this is not a dangerous moment, that they're going to be okay. But you want them to experience as you want them to understand that you're going to stay there and so on, and not just immediately not care, right? So all of these things are really normal. Another thing that I notice a lot, for example, now that my daughter is, com is three or when she was two, is that they become kind of rigid sometimes. They're kind of obsessive. And I've had a lot of parents come and ask me, does my child have OCD? Should I worry about this, right? The way I understand it is they're finally understanding rules, right? But they have to be really rigid because they don't understand flexibility and they're still trying to get these rules, right? It's like when you learn a new language and you have to say exactly the same way because that's how you're learning the word and you can't really be flexible because you only know those words to say where is the bathroom. It's the same thing. So for example, I was telling her like, we first eat food, then we have a candy. This morning she was in the taxi, she gets car sick. You can have a candy. No, mama, I haven't had food. It's okay. No, no, I haven't had food, right? No. Or I told her one day, you have to wear socks because the floor is wet. Now she wants to wear socks every single day because you have to wear socks, right? And it's not that she's being, I mean, I'm not saying that some kids don't have OCD because they can, but a lot of it is understanding, like, this is the way we do things. And the only way I'm going to learn them is by doing it over and over and over again in exactly the same way. Or I might be telling her a story, right? And she'll tell me, say it again, say it again, say it again. And I'm like, okay, I already told you this 15 times. Well, if you think about how we learn anything, for example, a new word in a different language, you have to hear it at least 20 times for you to learn it. So for them, it's the same thing. They have to hear it and rehear it until it really kind of gets into their brain and they can process it. So is it exhausting to have to explain 15 times that this is a museum and what are any museums and blah? It is exhausting. But that's the way they learn, by repetition, repetition, repetition. And at some point, it really gets consolidated and they move on. But until it's consolidated, they'll keep asking for the same thing over and over again. So if your child is turning a little bit obsessive, they want the, the blanket here, the towel here, they want the shoes like this. At this age, we see that a lot. <coughs> you don't need to worry a lot. Defiance, tantrums. So most of the time, again, they're starting to become more independent when they're about two, three, and they want to be their own persons. They want to have their own personality, right? Before it was all mommy, all daddy, kind of like completely attached to parents. Now they want to do their own. And a lot of the ways they do it is by being defiant. Like, no, I don't agree. No, no. There's some excitement about saying no, because of course they get a reaction from the parents and it's exciting. But it's also like, I want to do things my own way. So of course there are things that you can't allow, but some of that is completely normal. Again, you want your child to develop, to feel independent, to feel confident. And a lot of that is going to come through you because you're the main person in their lives, or the parents are usually the main person in their lives. So they're going to be more defined, more oppositional with you in a way of developing their own independence and their own kind of sense of identity. The other thing is that, again, they don't have enough words to express their concern, their frustration. So at some point they lose it, you know? They try, they use, they use some words, and then if, if they can't handle it, then they, they cry, right? And of course when they're tired, when they're hungry, you see much more of that. 
we as adults have a lot of impulse control, right? Like if someone steals your taxi, you want to start screaming at them. But you have enough impulse control, most of us do, to say, OK, this is not going to go well. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pull them out of the taxi. I'll just wait for the next one. And I might make them a face or something, but that's going to be it, right? Little kids have very little impulse control, no filter. They just do what they're thinking, right? So that's a lot of times why they have meltdowns, why they hit, because they can't control themselves yet. And if we have too high expectations, they just get frustrated, because they can't really comply. And they want to, but they don't have enough impulse control. So if you understand that this is part of development and that it's normal, it's much easier to deal with it. Right? For example, the typical little one, you give them the spoon, they throw it to the floor. You give them the spoon, they throw it. <laughs> After 20 times, you're like, OK, you're not having the spoon anymore. A lot of parents take that as defiance, right? And sometimes it might be if they're older, but a lot of times it's a game. Kids make a game out of everything, right? My daughter thinks it's so much fun to have me chase after her after getting her bath to get her dressed. She laughs, she hides, and I'm completely frustrated. I'm like, you need to go to sleep, right? For her, it's a game. So kids learn through play, and they'll turn everything into play. And so you have to say, OK, we're not playing anymore. Time to go to bed, right? But if you take it as a game, as them seeing it as a game versus them being defiant, it's much more easy to tolerate. Than, than, than thinking they're really being kind of defiant or oppositional. And as I said, rituals. Kids really thrive with structure. They really like it when they know exactly what's happening and they have because it gives them some control. Again, they have very few choices, right? Like this morning I told her we have to go to school. I already went. Yeah, but we go every day. No, but I already went, right? And think about it. How many choices do they have, right? If they have to go to school, they have to go to school. If they have to go to the pediatrician, to the park, even play dates, we choose them for them, right? So if they know what's going on, if they have a sense of a ritual, they usually do much better. Kids like surprises, but they usually do better when it's <coughs> pretty structured and when they have some sense of control. Another thing that I see a lot is during play, kids can be very bossy, right? And you're like, why, why, why won't you? For example, my daughter likes me to sing her a song at night. So it's always about Minnie Mouse. Minnie Mouse goes, she tells me what the song needs to say. So Minnie Mouse goes to play with the park, and then this happens. So I sing it. I'm like, OK, Minnie Mouse goes to the park, and Donald Duck comes. No, Mama, Donald Duck doesn't come. I never said Donald Duck could come, right? And I'm like, OK, give me the whole script so that I can tell you exactly what you want to hear, right? We all like to be bossy. We all like to do our own thing, except we've learned to share, right? And so in play, kids want to have control. Kids want to tell you what they want to do, and it's OK. If you let them lead the play, if they want to play Candyland in completely the opposite way, just throw the cards around, go the opposite way. If they want to build with the Lego blocks something completely different, let them. Let them have control over the play, because you'll enjoy it more. It'll be less of like a struggle, and the child would really enjoy it as well. So the, the key point is that most parents struggle with a toddler. We're all pretty, ex we're all really excited, we adore them, but it's a, it's a struggle. You're not alone. So don't keep your concerns to yourself. If you share them to your friends, you'll see that they're all going through something very similar. Kids are still developing, and they just don't get a, have a sense of the world. So they're just practicing and trying to get it, and it's going to take them some time, right? And don't worry too much, because a lot of the things you're worried about are completely normal behaviors. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> socialization now. So I kind of mentioned before that the children really are, or our model of children is that children are social at birth. If you listen to the lay literature or read the literature about parenting, a lot of times you'll think about um, uh, ideas that people want to promote for you to consider your children as little monsters that need your guidance. It's not maybe the worst metaphor ever, but actually children are very much more prone to be socialized. They are really inclined to seek out your attention, to seek out interactions with you. And in that way, they're not really monsters at all. They're very social creatures. They're very social beings. So they really have a preference for um, you early on, preference for your smell, preference for your face, preference for your attention. And I think that, that, that Ken and Natalie really <coughs> highlighted how play can really be a social engagement and that 
that play and your interactions with them can really influence how they learn and manage behaviors. So um, this part of the, uh, the conversation for me is kind of trying to talk about how to model for your children ways to, um, to socialize in more effective ways. That the things that you do, the ways that you interact are really going to have a profound influence on the things that they do. Um, I like the examples that Natalie gave about her daughter, so I'll share one with you about my daughter, um, um, which I think was, um, for me, a way to, to take her social understanding and try to um, uh, follow along with her and then kind of add a little bit more to the social interaction to make it, in a way, in my mind, kind of deeper and richer. So she had, a, as, a, uh, as a newborn, a teddy bear, and this was Daddy Teddy. So um, she had a lamb as well, and the lamb was mommy, but the lamb was kind of less uh, regular showing. Daddy Teddy was around quite a bit. So at one point, so this Daddy Teddy was around all the time, but about six months ago, we were at the hospital visiting her great-grandmother, and um, we saw this same Teddy in the, in the store. And so she saw the Teddy, and she was very excited because it looked exactly the same. And um, and eventually I got this Teddy for her because she did a really good job of managing things. So this became Mommy Teddy. So now you have Daddy Teddy and Mommy Teddy. <laughs> and so she has the two Teddies and she has them interact with each other and they're talking to each other. And so as I'm watching her interact with these teddy bears, I also have them talk to each other and have them talk to her. And when Oh, when she's a little defiant um, uh, about changing her diapers because she says, no way, no way. Uh, I told her that the teddies love to change her diapers. So they kind of like um, swarm on her and tickle her until we can get the diapers changed. So they now have this other role. So they're daddy and mommy teddy, but they also love diaper changing. Um, and, um, and then I told, uh, I, we had been listening to a song, a Disney song, a best of friends. So I said to her, oh, I think this is the teddy song. And now, Mommy and Daddy Teddy are both the best of friends. So it's kind of like I was looking, following her lead about these, her understanding about the Teddies, but also trying to give her just a little bit more modeling, kind of a deeper and richer connection. Now Daddy and Mommy Teddy and Mommy and Daddy for real, um, also have another relationship too because we talk about how mommy and daddy are best friends. So it's kind of trying to help her understand through her play and her interactions and some of our modeling um, uh, that, that there's a deeper and richer social connection that I want her to think about. Um, uh, I think through the play with her, her doll, she also really shows the lessons that she's learning about understanding what other people feel and what other pe people think. So it's very common to think about um, uh, how a child might take care of a doll or take care of a, a teddy bear as a sign of their own empathy for their taking care of themselves. And it's a great way, I think, to enhance their, the quality of their interactions with um, uh, that they're receiving from you, but also that they can kind of think about how social interactions occur in a very positive way. In terms of peer interactions, I think at this age, we have higher and higher expectations on our kids to start to interact more effectively with other kids. But I think it's fair to keep those expectations um, uh, very balanced so that if, um, uh, uh, in, for my daughter's case, when we go to a little gym activity, she doesn't really do a whole lot of interacting with other kids. She often is playing by herself while the other kids are playing at the same activity. So that kind of parallel play is really totally appropriate. Um, there is modeling still going on. So she is watching, even if she's not looking at other kids all the time, she's watching what they're doing and she's engaged in a group activity and enterprise, but even if there's not a lot of interaction between them, that's totally fine because there's a lot of uh, um, uh, messaging, so, so to speak, that's still going on. She's still picking up on a lot of interactions. And I think enhancing in small ways those kind of interactions. So um, if they're both, they're both playing with balls and asking them to share the balls um, in a prompt is totally fine. And if they don't do it, that's okay too. Um, uh, uh, but giving them some indication of what you, what you expect and what you want. 
In terms of kind of the key points, I think I'll expand upon these a little bit as I talk, but the first is really in terms of socialization, socialization, being positive in the way that you interact with your child is so essential to the way that they're going to interact in, in the rest of the world. So they, all of the ways that you, um, you feed them with your positive uh, inclinations, your, your caring for them, is going to translate to how they interact with other people. Um, the, the things that I tend to think about, this is true for all human interactions, in fact, marital interactions probably more than any, that any negative interaction you have needs about 20 positive interactions to counteract the effect. So if you're kind of sharp in your tone with your partner one time, you got to do 20 really positive tones to make up for that. And I think that um, it's a nice model to think about in terms of how we would like ourselves to be treated, but also how to think about um, interacting with our kids. Because as Natalie said, there's a lot of times and a lot of opportunities to say no. Um, but if you are uh, more often trying to say yes or steer them in another direction towards something that you want in a positive way, I think that you're much more likely to get uh, positive outcomes. And much more compliance. So um, I told you my no way to the diaper changing is now the teddy bear a diaper changing tickle ritual. But, um, but, but my daughter and I also do a no way game kind of. So she says no way, I say no way, and then we say no way, and then we go back and forth and back and forth. But it often is very playful and engaging, and it, it ends up leading to her compliance eventually. She does, I think, want to exercise control in the way that Natalie said, but she also recognizes that daddy is telling her that's the rules. and, and and I think that with most uh, adults that I know, time is such a pressure. Uh, uh, so we're always trying to work quickly, and our toddlers move at a very different pace. So if we have, if we can slow down our efforts, it's much more easy to be positive as well. That it's when we're really in a rush to get out of the house in the morning or to get ready for bed that we don't really afford the opportunities for them to direct the play that they want to direct or the interaction the way they want to interact. And so if we can just slow down a little bit, it's much easier for us to be more positive, I think, in the way that we interact. There's a notion that, um, that, that in, in some of the work that we do here, when we have kids who are having more profound behavior problems, there's a notion that the starting point of helping them overcome their behavior problems is to try to let them direct the interaction. And so the phase of this treatment is called child-directed interaction. And it's really saying, we want them to say what they want to do. And as parents, we want to give them the time and space to do that. So this is following them along in their play, commenting without telling them what to do on the play that they're doing. So noticing what they're doing, telling them that you like what they're doing, showing an interest in what they're doing, but letting them be the bosses of how that interaction goes. So in in this concept of being positive, I think using positive terms is very nice, but also letting them be the bosses or direct the interaction and making sure you protect that time is, I think, a very important in ingredient to getting the best results. Um, in terms of being firm and clear, um, uh, the, I think the times um, when you have to there's probably two things that I would recommend. One is, um, if your toddler is two, you can use two words to give them a command. And if they're three, you could use three words to give them a command or direction. So um, um, uh, you don't want to use more language or more explanation or more description than they really need to hear when you're setting a very firm, firm limit. Um, uh, uh, and, and so um, your tone shouldn't be punitive or nasty. It should be firm. Um, and so mastering that is really important. Um, and um, if you have a partner that um, will tolerate it, practice on them so that you can practice on, on, on your child so that you can really get the tone right, um, <clears throat> that they'll be very responsive. The only other thing I'd say is that Times where there's no behavior problems happening are also good times to reinforce behavior expectations that you have. So um, <clears throat> I play a game with my daughter that is also um, uh, I've called the big belly game because I have a you know a nice uh, gut. Um, so so when 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 she's lying down, she pushes her feet against my my tummy and she sometimes kind of kicks a little bit, but. 
I told her when we're playing around, that's okay with daddy, that's not okay with mommy. And so when, we're, when she's relaxed and she's comfortable, she'll listen to those messages because I can say them very calmly and I can say them in a positive interaction. And so I can use more words at those times to tell her what my expectations are for her. When you're having to be very firm in the moment, when you're trying to discipline, using briefer words and being uh, uh, tone neutral is important. Um, I think that Natalie and Ken both described that play and the effort to engage in the different behaviors and emotions are all really a sign of a child's um, kind of natural developmental desire to have mastery. Um, so I think of all, so much of the things that my daughter does as a sign that she really wants to be the master of her abilities and her domain. So the repetition of activities, the being kind of in control of what she does, all seem to me to be a sign that she's really practicing and practicing and practicing so she's in charge and so that she's in control. And so I think thinking about what they like to do as kind of an effort to be their own masters is a really good idea. Even though you're not saying they're the bosses, you're, you're allowing them the opportunity to develop mastery and to, to promote mastery. Okay, um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Natalie again um, to talk a bit more about when concerns arise. I think it's a little bit of a tricky topic because on one hand we're telling you don't worry. On the other hand we're saying sometimes you do have to worry. And it's really important because there's a lot of research showing that if you intervene early, you can have a really different positive outcome. And if you wait too long, especially with language and so on, it's much harder to get the same results, right? And um, we actually know based on research that very few children are getting the interventions that they need. I think a lot of parents might have concerns, but it's so hard to face if your child has a problem and to, and, and to kind of process it and think about it that a lot of times they say, okay, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait, and then sometimes it's really late, right? So one research study that we're looking was saying that about 12 to 20% of children who need intervention are receiving it. So, which means we have to be really observant about those things. Um, so, the other thing is that we have so many great treatments available, right? We have so many things that could be really helpful that it's completely okay if you have a concern, go to your pediatrician, right? Find, f ask for, 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 for advice. You have, most of you have a lot of friends with toddlers, I'm guessing. If you go to a playground and you see that your child is not doing a lot of the things other children are doing, if, if they really seem to not be progressing as they should. I, for example, given that I, I speak two languages, a lot of my friends have the same and they ask me, for example, if, if my child is uh, hearing Russian and English at home, or Spanish and English, and he's not speaking. He's two and he's not speaking, but I think it's because he's exposed to two languages. Well, you know, at some point, if they're not reaching the milestone on time, you should still be concerned. You should still look for advice, because there might be something going on and you might be missing on it. So if there is a concern, the sooner you have a solution, the sooner you know what's going on, the better. You're either going to be reassured or you're going to get treatment. And remember, a lot of treatments nowadays work really well, and you can really help your child. To, to develop better. And if, for example, if your child is, de is delayed in language and you help the child with that, then they're gonna do much better socially in terms of their behavior because they'll be able to communicate. So it's also a way to help the child feel better, feel more confident and develop better with peers and with, with parents. So what should you do? The first concern, if you, if you say, well, my, my child is not really walking well, or he falls too much, or he's not really speaking, or she's not really speaking like her peers, go to the pediatrician. Now, I do have to say, and I don't know how many of you have this experience, that you know these well-child visits that last seven minutes are sometimes really hard to, to intervene, right? So be really assertive. And if you have concerns, make sure, you know how they make you fill out those things now? And so they just kind of look over that and move on. If you have concerns, this is your child, this is your time with a pediatrician, make them stop. Make them spend time, ask every single question you have, and, they're, and if they're in a rush, it's really their problem. You really have to have all your questions answered. A lot of my friends go and they're like, well, you know, I didn't have time because there were so many people waiting. Your child has the right to the world child visit and you really have to make sure that you have every single question answered. And if you have concerns, you can go whenever you want, right? Make sure you really trust your pediatrician. I have seen, for example, 
particular cases that I know of where the pediatrician was kind of really old fashioned and maybe wasn't aware of all the new interventions and they, the pediatrician kept saying, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. If you're still concerned, if you really think your child is not developing well, go to the next step, ask for more help because some pediatricians aren't so kind of involved in child development or in child psychiatry, psychology, and it's really good to make sure that you are reassured. <coughs> Development pediatricians, development psychologists, they're around. They know all about this. They can be very helpful. We have a, an early childhood evaluation service for preschool children age one to five. And so we mostly, the concerns are usually language development, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, and so on. And you can really you know, have all your questions answered and feel better if you know what's going on. Um, sometimes late bloomers don't catch up, right? Some, some kids just take longer. and as, as Ken said, there's a phase, there's a range, and it's completely normal to take some more time. But if they're still not catching up on their own, they usually need additional support, right? Sometimes if they miss milestones, that might mean that they have some type of disability or some delay that needs treatment. That's said, not all the time. For example, I can give you an example. I, I saw, I've seen a couple of patients who come and they're 13. And during the interview with the parents, the parents say, you know, my child didn't crawl, she didn't crawl. And, you know, nowadays we know that some children just don't crawl. And, I mean, it's good for them to crawl because their muscles get stronger, so they don't fall as much when they're walking. But it doesn't mean that there's a problem. And I was thinking, you know, if this mom had heard this 13 years ago, she wouldn't have been worried about this for the past 13 years, right? So a lot of times just getting that professional advice is really reassuring. But sometimes there are problems, and it's better to face them early on than to keep waiting and then have to deal with more problems. Um, and again, talk to people. Make sure that a lot of parents keep it to themselves. It's just so hard to face. It's a lot of us go into avoidance. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then if it's not, you have to deal with more problems. So ask for professional advice if you have concerns. And again, when we see, when you have concerns, what could it be? It could be a developmental communication disorder, some type of speech delay, some type of speech problem. It could be that the child isn't hearing well, or has that's very common, right? That children aren't hearing well, and so therefore they're not really developing or talking as much as they should, or they're not really responding to you because they can't hear you well. Coordination problems, so you know anything that has to do with running, walking, things like that. And then sometimes, thankfully it's not so common, children can have autism or pervasive developmental disorders. And what we know about PDD or an autism is that if you treat in the first three years, you can see amazing results. And again, the longer you wait, the harder it is for the children to respond. And nowadays we have really good treatment to help children with autism relate and develop better. Your turn. Thank you. Okay. Um, because we we have uh, we have uh, only several minutes left, I do want to to open the the floor up for for discussion as as quickly as I can. So I'm going to sort of race through the uh, the uh, the part of this presentation that deals with uh, the early intervention services that are um, that are part of in uh, in most. Um, Actually, no. In all 50 of the states, it is it is part of the law that that early intervention services are provided for children from uh, from birth to age three. Um, I do have quite a number of resources in um, in this in this presentation, which will be available online. And um, if you are in the New York City area, the, I also have some some resources that uh, those of you that are here with us right now, those uh, of you that are are watching uh, online later, are available on the Advocates for Children website. There are resources for early intervention and. Um, how to go through the process, and then again, if any of you ask the questions, I'll be happy to answer those things. Um, but I do want to to move um, move forward into the the discussion phase of of this lecture, and really uh, see if anybody has any specific questions. Yes. Some of them was kind of uh, reassuring, but still 
and my child case, his my main concern is his social emotional uh, behavior. And now you you said it's a little bit too <coughs> different to uh, to, uh, to the standards too high how he should interact. But my concern is when he's hurting himself, he actually draws blood. That's a little bit for me is scary. <coughs> That's mm -hmm. something that I am concerned. So. My question is whether he, the, I am and his father in court, and the child is kind of in between right now. His uh, father visitation, he comes back. Um, sometimes really started when he started um, going to child visitation, and I don't know whether it is something happened to him. It's just like his whole behavior changed right away, pretty much, almost. I mean, and he started when he was one and five. And uh, the first one that came up to the second, he was just screaming, going in, was uh, stop eating, stop sleeping. But that phase kind of passed and it seems like he got used to it. But still, he never was um, the child that he was more. I never I didn't know what the he was mm -hmm. until he started going to meditation. So I, I understand that in this age it's normal for tantrums it's normal for you no know, listening the nose it's all it's normal but <coughs> at what point do you have to say okay this is normal this is not so yeah normal. of course so that's my question i guess um, yes, I'm just gonna I'm gonna paraphrase the the question uh, just so so um, for the for the purposes of online viewers. Um, question has to do with uh, an eight eight month old child that has a diagnosis of of PDD NOS non specific. Two years. Two, oh, two years, eight months. Two years, eight months. But there's also an issue of, of parental separation and visitation, which, which tends to, I even in the absence of, of a, uh, a PDD um, NOS or any of the difficulties or challenges that are related to that, uh, complicates, um, complicates behavior and, and uh, planning for, for children in any of those circumstances. Um, so, as as far as uh, I'm sorry, I lost the second half of the question. <laughs> what is normal? What is normal? Well, okay. Okay. Um, as as far and uh, feel free to to chime in as well. Um, as far as what is normal, as far as these behavioral tantrums that are occurring, <laughs> generally in in the situation um, where where parental separation is involved, changes to routines and visitations in particular can result in um, in behavioral struggles, including tantrums and crying and fits, and um, any any other words that we can use to describe those. And those are normal reactions to changes in the routine, Natalie had initially spoken about rituals that children have and how we get them onto a schedule of doing things, things that are very comfortable for them. But then when we add other factors like this in, that's a change to that ritual, that's a change to that routine, and, and um, children have to learn how to, how to adapt. And they may not necessarily, especially in the age range of two to three years old, have that flexibility in order to make Make that adjustment. So, independent of anything else that's going on, the the visitations themselves can can have a, a reaction that is normal, involving tantrums and involving crying or fits. Now, you would also. So, you want to no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, something. <laughs> I always talk a lot. <laughs> that's okay. So, um, so I, I think the one thing that I would would also add to to your question is. The underlying idea about about um, PDD is that there's a struggle for children who have that diagnosis or who are on the autistic spectrum. The struggle, the primary struggle, is with understanding social um, norms in the way that most of us do. Um, so there are there is some indication that children who are uh, diagnosed with PDD might not uh, orient towards people's faces as much. They might struggle to learn language, which is really a consensual way of, of interacting in the world. And, and they, it seems to me that the primary underlying struggle is one uh, that is tied to socialization. 
they are um, children who tend to really like things to be very <coughs> predictable and stable and orderly. So your description of some of the struggles is it, it gives some indication for why that's a tougher time. Because switching from one house to another can be very, very challenging and disruptive towards that desire that a child who has PDD has to have things be the same and be kind of very predictable and orderly. So as hard as it is to have both households have the same rules, the same ways of interacting, the same places for a, your son to be calm down and be relaxed is, is really important um, because that stability will, will mean a lot. We see sometimes children who have PDD who, if they come into your office one meeting and they look around the office, they notice everything, and they come back one other time and something has been put in a different place, they notice that and they are disturbed by that because it's disrupting their sense of predictability and, and familiarity. So I think that that's probably the first thing that I would think about, that just that stability of, of, of placements is really important. Um, because you have had a diagnosis, meaning that someone, a professional, has seen your son and said there is a meaningful struggle that your son has with social social norms, it, 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 uh, or social understanding, then I would think that, that that's where um, the best way to promote stability in his life in general is to have him in a more educational setting where there's lots of intervention, lots of supports in place, so that every day he gets um, uh, behavioral interventions to help him manage things yeah, and exposed to lots of services. So that, that ends up being for these youngsters very, very important to have them in the right context, context the right setting to really promote their, de their, their development. Yeah. And I would say that if, if he's hitting himself and it's pretty severe, I would definitely get help for that. I wouldn't think that that's normal at that point. Yeah. And the second, uh, she said, well, he's just too, too small to do anything at this point, and um, she kind of didn't address much of anything. But someone, a child who's two and eight months could probably do behavioral work, no? Yeah, so the, 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 yeah, so the ABA <coughs> should be targeting this as the primary problem. There's an intervention called ABA that really stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis. And they're specialists who try to use to change children's behavior in very small ways um, over time by degrees. And so that person should have as one of their primary goals um, uh, many times they're focused on teaching a child as young as two to learn habits for eating um, or to learn habits for for putting on their clothes. But if these behaviors of uh, hurting himself are, uh, are present, that should be the main focus for what the ABA person's working on because they need to work to slowly shift his behaviors away from those, those ways of being so that he's not getting hurt. That should be their target, their number one target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's also important yeah. for, for strong parental coordination between the ABA therapists and both parents in order to ensure that, that any of the interventions that are being put in place in school within the ABA program are consistent um, at home regardless of, of parent home just to make sure that things are, are consistent and, um, and predictable for, for the child so that, um, so that they can really benefit from it. Do we have any other questions? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us. There is, uh, just to highlight that there is this talk, um, the next talk is on really uh, when you're handling behavior problems, how to intervene and how to address that, and that's by Dr. Stephen Kurtz. Thank you very much, yeah, have a great day.